Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're broadcasting from the Thomas K. McKeon Center for Creativity, and I'm your host, Corey D. Taylor. My guest has appeared with Bill O'Reilly as well as Fox & Friends. He's none other than Pat Campbell. So stay tuned because this is Up Close with Corey Taylor. Welcome back, and thank you for joining us. And we're here with radio talk show host Pat Campbell. How are you, sir? Great. Man, I'm glad you're here, man. Like, look, look. So I've been hearing about you for years, and people were telling me about your show, and they was like, yo, you got to listen to Pat Campbell sometimes and check him out. You know, he really be dealing with some heavy subject matter. But before we do all of that and talk about you, man, tell me a little bit. What have you been up to? What have I been up to? What? Locally? Or? Locally, nationally, everything. Just whatever. Run the gamut, man. Just locally, the big thing has been the presidential election. I mean, okay. we've just been all over that. Of course, here in Oklahoma, a lot of the state questions, too. Those were, you know, crucial to a lot of my listeners, getting them information, helping to make decisions. But the, the presidential election has just consumed talk radio Wow. for the last 15, 18 months. Yes. Yeah, so when you talk about here locally, what are some of the things you're doing on a national level? Well, the national level is presidential, pretty yeah. much. And, and, and right now we're getting into, well, today we talked about, you know, the tragic shooting yeah. in Fort Lauderdale at the airport. Got into some of that. I had some experts on. I had a terrorism expert on talking about that, what we can do to prevent things like that, what's really behind all of this. Um, a lot of presidential politics still, too, about Trump, his cabinet, you know, what's what's going to be going on in the next two, three weeks here in Washington, D.C. Wow. It, it, there's there's a lot of um, Oklahoma players that are being pulled in. T.W. Shannon. Shannon. Yep. You've got Jim Bridenstine. Imagine Jim Bridenstine, that, Congressman Jim Bridenstine. Yes, yes. 41 years old. And here's what you're being offered. You can either be a secretary of the Air Force or B. <laughs> you can head up NASA. <laughs> oh, right, right. I don't like, know. Like, that's a whole I don't thing, know. Right? I, don't know exactly. I think I want to go to Mars. I'll take NASA. Yeah, right. You know? that, but that's so awesome because I know even at a, a certain point, um, I'm connected with some people and, you know, Mary Fallon. And right. then we just got the um, Scott the, Pruitt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Scott Pruitt so, going for the EPA. And know? this is so crazy because, you know, I've been in Oklahoma probably around eight years right. now. And when I first got here, understanding that Oklahoma is a, you know, pretty much a dominant red state conservative right, right. but who would have ever thought that a lot of the players that are in Oklahoma are now yeah. being pulled to the national level you know yeah. of course we always have our congressman or our right, senator or whatever right. but to be pulling on so many people from this state yeah. like what does that say to you well it tells me we got some good players here I mean that have obviously attracted Donald Trump's attention one I left off is congressman Mark Wayne Mullen yes who's a District 2 congressman, but he's being considered for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Really? So, man, it's like everybody's... They, and, and that changes everything locally here, because all of a sudden that's going to open up District 1, and you already got about eight people jockeying for that. And if anything happens in District 2, you're going to have people, you know, running for Mark Wayne Mullen's seat as well. Man, so when you are... On your talk show, man, what drives do? I know it's news and it's topics, but what made you? Because I, I understand that you're a former math teacher. Right. But what made you come into this space of talk radio? All right. Well, I've always been a news junkie. Okay. okay? And I remember when we first got um, headline news. Remember back in the day? Yes, sir. Oh, I thought this is great. This, this, this is the best ever. Right, right, right. I get, I get news whenever I want it. I don't have to wait till 6 o'clock at night to get the national news. And back then, it was like the same 30 minutes over and over and over. But I'd sit there and I'd watch it. <laughs> <Right. laughs> it the the day. Day. I just liked following news. <laughs> right. The weird thing is, when, when, when I graduated from, from high school or college, talk radio as we know it today wasn't really around. Exactly. Okay? So uh, I went to school, I was a math teacher for about six years, then I went to work for an aerospace firm. And what got me into talk radio was a buddy of mine, it was during the first Gulf War, okay? Buddy of mine turned me on to Rush Limbaugh, right? right? And I started listening to Rush, and back then, he was at his creative peak. It wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> Republican all day long. Right. He did, he did uh, uh, plays, I mean, he had skits, everything. It was just crazy, right. you know? It was, he was really creative. So I, I lived in Northwest Pennsylvania at the time, and a couple of times I left the station on after Rush's show. And we had a local, what I call Alan Combs wannabe. He was a liberal talk show host. Okay. And I come from a very big family. I'm the oldest of 13. I'm used to arguing. I like getting into it, okay? So he would get on the radio and say the most outrageous things, and I'd be like, that's crazy. And I'd pick up the phone and I'd call him. Nine, nine times out of 10, 
I was running circles around, okay? Right, Which right. should not happen if the, if the host is doing things right. Right. So to make a long story short, uh, my little stint at the aerospace firm was about to come to an end because they were going out of business due to competition from south of the border. Okay. Right? And so I took a buyout basically to sit on the beach, and I had already signed a contract to go back into teaching. And when I did that, in a one-week period, I got a call from two talk radio stations that asked me, if I'd ever thought of being a talk show host. And I said, no. And they said, would you like to try an audition? So I said yes to the station that was opposite this guy. Because if, I, if this works, <laughs> this works, I'm coming for you, buddy. I'm He's coming like, I'm for you. Okay? All right. So I go in for my audition. It's a three-hour audition. Five minutes before the show, the owner of the station walks in. He says, we're going to see how good you are. And I said, how so? And he says, the phones are out. Okay. Now, for most, most people would just like freeze. Okay. Right, so, uh, right. So I said, no problem. I had my, my briefcase with me. I had a stack of stuff to talk about. So about an hour and a half into the show, AT&T got the phone lines up. And the rest of the show, I got calls and stuff. After the show, the guy offered me a job. Wow. Okay. So I go home to my wife and I said, they want to pay me to talk on the radio. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. I said, they're insane, man. I said, yes. they want to pay me to talk on the radio. Right. Everybody I knew told me not to do it. Everybody. Really? Everybody. Don't do it. Most of them had, had bad experiences with radio. They didn't want to see me hurt. And they just didn't think it was a wise career move. My gut said, go for it. I've exactly. never looked back. Never looked back. And that's been about how many years now? 23. I started in November of 1993. Wow. Yeah. And you know, when you, and you just said something that was so poignant, and I really want to point that out for our viewers. When you're a talk show radio host, Anything could go wrong. Like you said, the oh, phones went down, yeah. but they happened to go down in the middle of your audition. Yeah, yeah. And you have to have the ability to communicate yep. knowing that nobody's going to be giving you feedback yeah, on that other yeah, end and yeah. keep it moving and keep it interesting. And a lot of people, I'm just like you in so many respects, is they, they would ask me, why you listen to Russ, Rush or why you listen to uh, Hannity, yep. Cones, O'Reilly, um, Tavis Smiley, yep. you know, all these different people. Yeah. And I was like, because I love the art of conversation right. and debate and how to get in there and right. really keep people interested in yeah. what it is that you're saying. So when you are on the radio, how much of it would you say that you have to spend talking to phone people that are calling in versus you just having to go with the top. I've done whole shows where I don't take any calls. Okay. Um, and it, it's weird because they're, they're, they're more interested in content, compelling content. Yes. One of the things that took me a long time to learn was the art of storytelling. The best talk show hosts are the best storytellers. Exactly. Now you, you mentioned Rush Limbaugh, top of the list. Glenn Beck's up there. The best, in my opinion, is Michael Savage. Okay. Michael Savage is, in my opinion, crazy, okay? He's either up or down. But when he, when he gets in the zone, okay, right. he takes you back to his childhood. It's 1955. You're sitting on the porch step watching him in Brooklyn. Wow. It's that good. It's the theater of the mind. He That's takes what, us there. Absolutely. It's theater of the mind. Radio, when it's done properly, will transport you to a different place. Now, I'm going to say this for our millennials because there was a time, you know, we have the Internet, then we had television. Right. But there was a time that when the shows used to come on way back in the day, it was all radio. Yeah. And a radio personality had to be able to paint a picture through Perfect. words yeah. that put us right in the context yeah. of that story, you know. And I remember, like, War of the World yep. and, you know, oh, yeah. all of these different things. See, and he Beck, was, Beck is a huge fan of Orson Welles, and he studied him. Wow. It's the storytelling. One of the, one of the best guys at doing storytelling on the radio, and he's no longer doing radio full-time, is Art Bell. When he used to do Coast to Coast, okay. it was because he was, like, on in the middle of the night. And, I mean, we're talking alien abduction. <laughs> we're, we're going in search of Sasquatch. Right, I mean, it's right. just crazy. The people that would call in, the people were crazy, you know, but it was, it was really great theater. Exactly. And this is the thing that people don't get. Like, whether you're listening to talk radio and it's conservative or liberal, what they have to understand is people that listen to radio period are right. people that are listening for good content, Absolutely. you know, because you don't have visuals to keep you interested. Right. It has to be that voice, what that voice is saying, mm -hmm. how they tell a story. And that is my thing when it's coming to speaking in front of national forums and right. things of that nature It's the art of storytelling. And I've done that. And, you know, just like you told your wife, like, hey, they want to pay me to be on radio. <laughs> my friends from St. Louis, where I grew up and right. in that Ferguson area, they 
it's like, so dude, what are you doing now? It's like, well, I travel around the country telling the stories about where we right. grew up. And they's right. like, you're lying. Nobody's paying you to hear that stuff that we could care less about. I was like, no, actually yeah. they are because the way that I grew up was so different. So how much of your background do you bring into the context of your show? For, for me, initially, it was very hard to open up. I was very protective of my family, okay? Right. Um, and, and some of that was tied in with a, a really bad incident I had early on, 1997. I had a guest who <laughs> is a real work of art who actually <laughs> threatened to kill my then infant son. Wow. And, yeah, well, and, and, and this is the weird part. The, the way he found out about my infant son was a birth announcement in the newspaper. I don't do those anymore because that's information they can get. But I... I was initially dismissive of this guy. I didn't take him seriously. And I had a friend back in Pennsylvania who was a U.S. attorney. And I showed him some of the email exchanges between the two of us. And he says, uh, I want to get the FBI in. So I had two guys come in from the FBI. And they said, Campbell, you can pick them. They, they brought in a file. <laughs> oh, like, like this guy. This guy had been in jail for trying to, uh, to, to run over police officers with his car in Philadelphia. Wow. So it was serious. And, and, and at that point, I sort of you know, just, yeah, just got very protected. Yeah, buttoned but, up, yeah. But I have found the best stuff that I do on the radio has absolutely nothing to do with politics. It has to do with personal stories. In fact, I told a story on the radio uh, back in January on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade about my oldest daughter who had a child out of wedlock and how it came to me probably about three years ago wrapped up as a problem. Okay. Right. But, it, it, right, and, you know, right, and it was, right, a real, right. it was a real test for me. You right, know? right. Um, but it turned out to be the greatest gift ever because it, it was transformational with my daughter. She's done a 180. I got my little girl back, except she's a grown-up, beautiful woman now. She's right. a wonderful mother. Right. And now I got two beautiful little grandkids. Right. You know, and she's happily married. So it, it, telling that story, it was weird because I went to the pro-life march downtown, and I had people coming up to me. It was, it was weird. I've never had a response like this before. They're coming up and they're going, I was that dad or I was that girl. And thank you, thank you, thank you. I had one guy come up to me. He says, how did you tell that story without crying? I said, I couldn't until today. Mm. But that, here, here's the thing. I made a connection, an emotional connection with, I can't even put a dollar figure on it, okay? It's that powerful. But yeah. when, you, when you can tell a story, a personal story, and you connect emotionally with people, that's when you win. And you know what? And that's awesome because I had the opportunity to come on your show. Right. And then I was able to look at the response. And then all of a sudden, you know, because and that was awesome because we did not talk really about politics at no, all. No. We talked about stories. We talked right. about my background. We talked about parenting. And what was crazy, I started getting a lot of people from Facebook inboxing me and like, oh, that was awesome. Yep. Thank you so much. Twitter, you know, I started getting followers and stuff. And it was that they responded to that content that, yep. you know, you we engaged in in that dialogue. Now, when you're out there, because you just said this, you talked about having a radio, a threat. You know, yeah. how often does that happen? Very rarely. I, the weird thing is, and, and I, this was early on. You see the way I look, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't look like a typical radio talk show. <laughs> right, right. When, 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 like I started, the gym. when I started, people <laughs> used to go, and I used to be bigger too, but when I started, when people would meet me before the internet and everything, they would like disappoint it because they had an image of a radio talk show host that was older, fat, and bald, because everybody's supposed to look like Rush, okay? I'm, I, got the, I got the bald down. I got the bald down. I'm working on the older. I, I'm working too. on the older. The fat ain't working for me. Right. So they would be like, oh, you don't look like what I expected you to look like. And I'm there like, well, I'm sorry, you know, but it, it, it was weird in that respect. But a lot of times when they, they see me, um, I, I got a pretty strong physical presence. So Correct. that sometimes it does or doesn't match up with the voice. Right. I get that, man. Well, that's that's the thing with me. I, you know, a similar story is that I remember when I first started in um, getting in education and I that's my background. I came right. from education. Right. So debating is part of those things yeah. in education. And I was so big in stature, but my voice carried. Right. And when I would sit into interviews, I would have people that were on the side of the interview and they'll they'll be like, oh, my God, you're not going to get the job. And I'm like, why? They was like because the way you came across on paper was less intimidating yeah. than you are yeah. in public. And right. I was like, 
How am I intimidating? Yeah. They said, well, look at you. You're like 6'3", you're big, Got your voice, voice carry. Yeah. Yep. And they were like, so the, the people are scared to bring you in. Right. And so I noticed that I had to kind of tone it down right. so that people could ha not have this crazy perception. Right. So like you said, when people meet you, they're disappointed, but then do they ever get over that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, it, 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 I don't even know if disappointed, disappointed back in, in the early days, but it's more of a shock because unless they've, they've gone to the internet and, and, you know, search for images of me, I, I'm not what they expect. So, yeah. But so, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that was it. Yeah. So, so the thing that I want to talk to you about now, now you are not just, we talked about national level earlier, but you're not just, you don't just do radio here, but you've been called on as to be a commentator for yeah. the O'Reilly Factor and Fox and Friends. Yeah. So yeah. how does that happen? Okay. Uh, when I, when I was in Orlando, I used to think that all the crazy stuff happened in California. <laughs> Then I moved to Florida, 2004, right, 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 right. and that is where it all goes down. I'm telling you, if you want crazy, go to Florida, okay? <laughs> and um, there was a, a case, I don't know if you remember, Jessica Lunsford. She was a nine-year-old girl. She was abducted by John Cooey. Okay. And she was killed. She was buried and killed, okay? Mm -hmm. And she had been sexually abused, too. Um, O'Reilly needed a point man in Orlando to keep him up to date on the sheriff okay. and, and what was going on. And uh, another friend of mine, who's a uh, nationally syndicated radio talk show host, Mike Gallagher, said Campbell's down there, Cole Campbell. So I get a call one day, and O'Reilly wants me on the program. Initially, I've got no idea. I, I said yes, okay. Initially, I got no idea, and he's, it's to talk about the Jessica Lunsford case. And, and my wife's driving me, and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. I, I've seen what he does to people that he doesn't like. <laughs> What happens? What happens? You know what I right, mean? Right, right. If he doesn't like me. The good news is he liked me, okay? Right. And he warmed up to me, and it turned into over 20 appearances on his show. Wow. That parlayed into a bunch on uh, Fox and Friends. And then back, back around that time, MSNBC still had some conservatives. I, I think you know who Tucker Carlson is. Yes. Tucker used to have a, a regular show there, and on Fridays they'd bring a a conservative and a liberal on. And Correct. he'd bring me on and somebody like Rachel Maddow. Yeah, right, and I just right. loved that stuff. It's yeah, just like, yeah, come yeah, on, yeah, bring it, it on. It's, you know? it's beautiful. So yeah. it, 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 it was a great opportunity. And because you're in Orlando, there's so many people that go there for symposiums, seminars. I mean, if I want guests, top of the line guests, they're right there in my backyard. I can get them in the studio. Right. You know, like Geraldo, I got him in the studio. And it, just, just all those people that were down there all the right. time, Newt Gingrich, people like that, they were just readily available. Man, so I want to say this, switch gears a little bit, because in the climate right now where we're fighting in this nation and, and going back and forth right. about stuff, what do you think about censorship? Because we are starting to see so many people right. be censored, right. no matter which side of the fence you're right. on. If you're liberal, you're censored. If you're conservative, of your sense. Yeah. What do you think about that? I want the government to keep its hands off the internet. Free speech is good speech. Exactly. You know, and it, 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 everybody's got this idea now that they have some sort of a constitutional or God given right not to be offended, <laughs> which is nonsense. You know, exactly. If you don't like what I'm saying on the radio, turn it off. Turn it off. Turn exactly. Off, turn the That's channel. It. Turn right. it. Just turn it. Or okay. don't read whatever don't read. is out there. You know, if you don't if you don't like what I'm saying on, on, on Twitter or Facebook, Block me. It's that simple. You don't, you don't, I mean, people get so worked up, right. so exercised over stupid stuff. Yeah. And it's so crazy because, you know, I, I see when like, especially athletes, right. you know, when they come out and they say something, I, f I think for me, constitutional wise, right. We still have rights as Americans, right. like, and, and freedom of speech is still wrapped up right. in that. But, right. and, and whether you agree with somebody or not, like, let them say what they want to say. Like, right. as long as they're not saying anything, you know, that's like life threatening to somebody, right. like in the case that you had, right. let them talk. Be, but, but be ready that if you don't yeah. like what they say, either turn it off, don't read it, yeah. don't look at it, yeah. or be ready to combat and come back and have right. something to say that you want to s express right. your point. We, we talked about it. You, you mentioned athletes. Now, here's the thing with athletes, though. They're not just speaking for themselves. They represent a brand. They play for a professional yes, team. Sir. When you represent that team, I'm, I'm surprised they don't actually have, and you can hire people, okay, <laughs> to, to filter your tweets. Yes. There's been some stuff that I wanted to tweet, and I looked at it, and I go, Nah, <laughs> don't get into that. I'm going to delete that one because that can be taken the wrong way. And exactly. it, can, it, can, it can be a career render. We just had a story this morning about a teacher out of Dewey, Oklahoma, who somebody's gone back on his Facebook. He didn't have the privacy settings right. And he has said some things over the years that I could see as offensive. Okay. Correct. 
Uh, I could have said everything he said without being as offensive, mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't. And, and now it's come back to haunt him, and yes. people, people want him fired. If, if I was teaching right now, I, the only reason I'm on Facebook is because I'm on the radio. If I wasn't on the radio, I wouldn't be on Facebook, okay? okay. I'd probably still be on Twitter because I'm a news junkie. Right. But y you, you have to think of whatever your job, your career is. If you're working for a company, okay, how does this look to an employer? Because I'm telling you, they're monitoring everything Correct. you're doing on social media. And especially for the millennials, you know, taking the pictures at the bar. Yeah. <laughs> Having, having weed in your head, it's all going to come back to haunt you, man. All of it. And yeah. I was just getting ready to say that because my thing is I have four children, as right. you know, and they're all adults. I have one that's left in high school, right. but she's on her way to adulthood. And the first thing I do, and people, they, they get upset with me, right. like, why are you in your kid's business? I'm right. like, listen, they are my children. I'm still responsible. Right. But if I see any kind of crazy picture that could be misconstrued on social media, right. period, right. they're getting a call from dad. Take yeah. that down because yeah. that will come back and haunt you. You can't yeah. go back and delete that stuff if it's because it'll be five or six years from now. Somebody will go back and find that picture and they'll make it about whatever you're trying to do. Right. That's on a big scale that present day. Yeah. You know, and so you're talking about that. So when you are and I understand you have five children, too. Right. So how do you deal with this situation I, with them being adults? I, I still especially with my youngest who's 13 right. okay i just let her go on instagram <laughs> but daddy's on instagram too daddy sees yes, it daddy sir. daddy approves everybody that joins her instagram and she knows the rules too you know but I, actually with all of my kids it's it's weird remember when willy wonka died gene gene wilder yes, right correct. okay the way i got the message i could t i could i could phone my daughters okay my older daughters they're not going to return a phone call. Right. I could text them. They might get back to me depending on how important it is. Instagram, I sent out the news that, that Gene Wilder had died, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Willy Wonka. Instantaneous response from all five of them. Because that's, that's, <laughs> that's where the they, they are. Exactly. That's the way they communicate. That's where they are. You gotta, you, if, you're, if you're looking for a particular group, especially under 25, for the, for the most part, they're not on Facebook. Face, I, in fact, I did a thing on this this morning. Facebook's for old people. Okay, yeah. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. My mother's on Facebook. She's right. 80. Okay, right, right. <laughs> she's down with it. Right. Um, it. It tends to be most people 25 and younger Twitter, are not Instagram, on it unless, right, right. unless they're forced to be on it for school. For example, my uh, second oldest daughter, Rachel, never had Facebook. So when she went to college, they wanted to know what her Facebook page was. She says, I don't have one. They're immediately suspicious. What are you hiding? Exactly. So exactly. She, she had to get one because that's how they communicate with the teachers. But that's all she uses it for. Mm -hmm. She's forced to participate in social media. Right. And here's the thing. There was this big old deal like... Um, I don't know if there was an evangelist by the name of Kim Burrell. Okay. And she just had a big old thing. And, I, you know, I'm coming back from the movies with my wife, like, on the, over the weekend. And then everybody's stuff in, on social media is going crazy about, you know, whether they like Kim Burrell or they're disassociating. Right. She's right. losing all kind of contracts and everything. But she says something about the LGTB community. Right. And so then it was, you know, I'm like you. I, I wanted to say something about this, but the first thing I thought about, okay, watch your wording carefully. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to let people know because so many people were responding to this adversely right. negatively towards her and then some people were being on the other side of the argument right. saying go good for you and the simple thing that I put up on Facebook was I said I'm just gonna keep I, I was like and so I put up the video I talk about it to let people know what was going on and then right. I, and I didn't say anything yeah I said you want to hear what I believe think about this and I just whoop I went silent yeah yeah I said, that's what I have to say about that. See, that's, said, that's what I use my social media like, and people don't always understand that. I use social media as crib notes for my show. <laughs> I will post stuff on Facebook, and I don't, I'm don't. i like you. I don't necessarily comment on it. I, I want to see what other people are saying. Exactly. But I, I put it up there to remind me, you need to talk about this tomorrow on the program. Exactly. That's, that's the way I use the social media. And I use Twitter like that, too. Although on Twitter, I tend to put a lot more of my opinions. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that's, and, but, but Pete, that's okay. Because I, I, even though with all of the censorship and right. stuff, I just want to see the world go back to allowing people, whether I agree with you or not, we can agree to yeah. disagree. Right. Say what you, I think we are going to have too much covert stuff going on when right. people lose that ability to be able to speak openly right. and honestly. Yeah. I'm not scared if you, I'm not scared, period, but I'm not scared if you express yourself because at right. least I know what you're thinking. Right. But when you're forcing me to have to figure out what you're thinking, that's when we have so many more yeah. assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. And my friends, sometimes they don't understand that because when someone is like against culture, 
right. know, African American or Hispanic or whatever, the first thing they want to do is fire off on social media. Yeah. And my first thing is, hey, if that's what they said, they are t entitled to their opinion. Yeah. You don't have to comment on everything everybody say because now right. you look at crazy. Yeah, yeah. You know, so what, what do you think about the fact of I, I want to go here real quick. Right. Um, I, I really want to ask you this question because <laughs> we, we, we got the we got the right. election. Right. And now the big debacle right now is Russia. Right. Intervening. What's your thoughts? Right. Well, the the whole hacking thing. OK. I haven't seen a lot of evidence to support it. Okay. All right. I know that they got into Podesta's emails. Um, there's some issues there with, you know, if, if I don't have secure communications and somebody hacks me, that's my fault. Okay. We've been in the business of hacking people <laughs> for a long forever. Time. Right. We just, it, we just got in trouble for hacking uh, Merkel's cell phone. Right. When, when the president was yeah, there. Angela you know? Merkel. Yeah. And, and exactly. all of a sudden, all of a sudden now we're, we're worried about, look, Trump, here's what, here's what Trump brings to the plate, okay? I, I think that most people would like to have better relations with all countries, including Russia, Correct. including China. The mindset, and this is what's really interesting for me, if you talk to people under 30, okay, and even under 40 in some cases, the idea of Russia being our enemy is foreign to them. They exactly. haven't gr they haven't grown up. They haven't grown the up. Cold War, the Cold yeah, War is, exactly. that was in a Rocky movie. That's right, what we're right, done with. Right, you know, right, Rocky right. Four, and we won. So it's over and done with. I'm but, a Rocko. But, yeah. but the, I, here's here's what Trump brings to the plate. Trump is a great negotiator, and when he negotiates, it's always a win win. And I think Vladimir Putin sees that in him. I don't trust Vladimir Putin. Okay, right. don't don't get me wrong. Right, I'm not pro-Russia, all right? Exactly. But if we can do something that is mutually agreeable to both sides, if we can work with them, why not give it a shot, right? D do you know anybody that needs more enemies or wants <laughs> no more one. enemies? I mean, wow. so it's, it's just the whole mindset. And, and I, think, I think that's lost, especially on the older generation, because they, they grew up, Russia's the enemy. Exactly. China's the enemy. Right, exactly. So this show, Up Close with Corey Taylor, is all about helping people to understand what yeah. it would take for somebody to be successful. In about five seconds, give me a couple of fast, rapid words that you would say define success in your opinion. To be successful, read, read, read. The more you read, one of, one of my, you know Jim Stovall, don't yes, you, sir. from the Narrative Television Network? This guy is blind, okay? He reads a book a day before I even start my show on audiobooks, on I listen to one, the, the way he's got it ramped up on the speed. Right. I can't even understand. It's Alvin and the Chipmunks, man, right, just talking right. in one ear. But you stop and think about that. He reads 365 books a year. Wow. Man, if you if you did that in just one area, let's say finances, okay? Yeah. In a couple of years, you, you've got an expertise that nobody else out there has. Hope you've enjoyed our show today. I would like to thank my guest, radio talk show host Pat Campbell, for joining us. Think about this. Change is inevitable, but your attitude towards that change, it is always optional. Until next time, keep looking forward. Thank <laughs> you.